Good morning. Well, I guess we're going to start off continuing on from where we left. We, we left off with uh, Jonathan Hayden talking about Jesus and his people coming towards Jerusalem. And now we're finally at chapter 11 where he's there. He makes it to Jerusalem. So if you have your Bibles, please join me in chapter 11. We're going to read through verses 1 through 26 together. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them that what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who is also in also who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we need you to illuminate the scriptures because your word contains hard passages to swallow. Give us ears that are willing to hear what Jesus is saying and give us eyes that are willing to see what Jesus is doing in this passage. May your word encourage and strengthen us to believe in you and your promises. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Early on in our marriage, I took Sarah down to San Bernardino, California, to a street called Newberry Avenue, to have a look at where my family used to live. Now, I moved out of that house when I was two, so my only memory was coming back every once in a while to pick giant and juicy pomelos from two pomelo trees in the backyard whenever they were in season. A pomelo is like a grapefruit, just more Asian. But that day, what I saw Instead, was a neighborhood completely devastated by decay and dilapidation. Both pomelo trees had withered up in the heat, barren branches and everything. The house itself was long abandoned. It was both strange and sad to see what had become of what my family once called home. All three stories in our passage today 
the triumphal entry, the fig tree, and the cleansing of the temple. They're all about coming home, except it's more like what happened to me in San Bernardino, or when you visit your parents' home and you find your childhood home looking like a generic guest bedroom. Your decorations, your books, your art, everything's been put away, different. Your memories and the present reality don't match. And what you experience in that moment is dissonance. That's what living as a Christian in this world is like. Dissonance. Wanting a true home and not finding it while we still live under sin and decay. This passage that we're reading today is about what happens when Jesus comes home. Except it isn't home. And if Jesus can't call it home, neither can we. We have to reckon with our own dissonance of not being home. And more importantly, we need to get home. But to do that, we need to answer these two questions. First, what is home? Second, how do we get there? What is home and how do we get there? So first, what is home? Well, home is supposed to be where we are welcomed where we are fed, where we are protected, and where we are restored. After all, that's what God does for his people. And it happens whenever God dwells with them. Home, you see, is wherever God dwells. We see pictures of this in the Old Testament, especially with the Israelites traveling in the wilderness. God was always present among his people, literally as a pillar of clouds by day and a pillar of fire by night. God fed them with manna, preserved their clothes, and fought their battles. And even in spite of the people's sin, God reconciled with them. When God dwelled with his people, his people were home. For the people in Jesus' day, God's dwelling place was in the temple in Jerusalem. And that's why Jesus and his disciples made their way there. It's supposed to be the Messiah coming home to God's dwelling place. This moment was supposed to kick off something new for the people of God. But Jesus doesn't see it that way. And he tells us so in two very troubling passages. And it's not just a troubling passage. It's a violent passage. Violent enough for Jesus to kill a tree. Violent enough for Jesus to drive able-bodied, religious, zealous, strong men out of a temple. What is going on? Well, we need to start first with the fig tree, a passage that seems bizarre, out of place, and maybe out of character. Why is Jesus cursing a fig tree? Well, first, verse 13 says that it was not the season for figs. So, you know, you don't go Asian pear picking in the middle of summer. You wait until it's fall, when the pears are at their largest, plumpest, and juiciest. So it seems obvious enough to not pick fruit out of season. Second, it says in verse 12 that Jesus was hungry. And if you're hungry, the last place you would go to get fed is a fruit tree out of season. Another obvious observation. You put these two things together, and you end up with a Jesus acting very hangry. This may not seem consistent with the Jesus we're familiar with. We might be tempted to even think that Jesus acted out of turn. But... We should take this passage more as an opportunity to question whether our own idea of Jesus matches the one found right here. We must trust in the real Jesus revealed in all the scriptures, no matter how he turns out to be. Jesus didn't act out of turn. Verse 14 deliberately points out that the disciples heard Jesus curse the fig tree. And it's this observation that tells us that Jesus intentionally acted out against an out-of-season fig tree. Why? Well, how would you react if your friend kept sticking their hand in an empty bag of chips and each time complaining about it being empty? You might think, and you might have a talk with them even, um, there's nothing there. There's always going to be nothing there. Just stop doing that. That's the reaction Jesus wants you to remember. He wants you to remember the absurdity of trying to satiate your hunger from a fruit tree out of season. 
So what Jesus is saying to us is don't seek relief from that which cannot offer it. And after the fig tree, we're led to the other violent Jesus passage. Verse 15, we have a picture of Jesus creating panic in the temple with crowds of people fleeing the temple grounds. This is Jesus' righteous anger realized, an indignation displayed as he drove the vendors out of the outer court, known as the court of the Gentiles. And as he's doing all of this, Jesus says something. Verse 17, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. You see, Jesus is evoking Isaiah 56 where the prophet envisions God gathering the Gentiles together with Israel to create a joyful house of prayer for all peoples. That vision of the temple harkens back to God's mission, going all the way back from the beginning. In Genesis 22, God promised to make a great nation out of Abraham, the patriarch of the people of God. But God's particular purpose was that through them, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And all through the scriptures, we see that. We see God bringing outsiders into God's family as a blessing from Rahab to Ruth, from Naaman to Nineveh. And when the temple was finally built under King Solomon, the prophets started speaking about the day when the nations would come to Jerusalem to seek God. This is the redemptive work that God has been speaking of all this time. And the temple in Jerusalem would represent God healing all the nations as they came to seek his face in true worship. But that day, what was it that Jesus saw? Instead of the sound of blessing, we have a cacophony of other sounds. The clinking of coins, the cooing of pigeons, the squeaking of scales, the grunts and casual conversations of those who treated the sacred court as if it were just a public road or a shortcut. You turn your ear to the left and to the right, not a single prayer to be heard. And just a few years prior, the priests had transformed this outer court into a marketplace to make sure they could get a cut of the sales. And so Jesus, invoking Jeremiah 7, calls this house a den of robbers. Here, there will be no rest. The Gentiles who've come, they're not going to find the blessing that they've sought so long for. And really, neither will the Jewish people. That temple season of fruition had long passed, and its roots were withered up from the inside out. You're not going to look for fruit from a tree out of season, and you're not going to look for rest from a place that can't be home. So put together, these two stories are really the same story. The fig tree is about the temple. And both stories play out the same way with one difference. The disciples, their reaction. They were oblivious to the true nature of the temple in Jerusalem. They were unable to recognize a corrupt temple offering nothing but exploitation, greed, and emptiness. We know this because we have the passage at the beginning of the reading. Jesus' triumphal entry. The beginning of chapter 11 shows the difference between what the disciples saw at the fig tree and what they didn't see entering Jerusalem. It showed us what we like to call these days as nostalgia. Nostalgia is the way that we rewrite our memories using current experiences. When we inject new meanings and feelings, when we recolor events from of old, it's just to the point that what we remember isn't what actually happened, but instead it's the story we tell ourselves about what happened. We often don't notice when it occurs. It can be positive or negative experiences. We don't even have to be too old to do it. I mean, my daughter tells me stories about when she was little. I was so cute. But it happens regardless. Because given the chance, our desires are going to retell our story the way we want to. It's like when a single 20-something Sarah watches Ella Enchanted with her middle school students, and they're all in on this idealized, fantastical love story. 
Sarah's experience of watching it gets all mingled up together with her childhood fantasies of marriage and love. Now that movie has become something special to her. Ten years later, she decides to share this special movie with her husband. And her first reaction after watching it again was, Sorry, honey, that was stupid. (laughs) Nostalgia can be innocuous and humorous, like a story of that one fish that got away. It just seems to keep getting bigger each time you tell it. But left unchecked, our nostalgia can blind our past, present, and the future. Yes, nostalgia cost my family 96 minutes of movie trauma, but the effects go far beyond. We start wishing for things we never had. We start yearning again to be who we thought we were. And based on that memory, we start to act on what we think we can become. So let's go back and think about the disciples welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem. What was it they thought they had? A lineage of great kings in the line of David. A kingdom that once conquered all of God's enemies. A time when all the nations came to give tribute to Israel. What was it that they thought they were? A people chosen by God, children of Abraham, his precious treasure. And what was it they thought they could be again? Watching Jesus riding in on a colt as a coming king, a chance to regain everything they thought they had lost, an opportunity to see God's face shining on his people again after the Romans get their comeuppance, after Israel ascends again to its rightful place, as the nation of nations, just as soon as the Messiah ascends to prominence with God's blessing at the temple, ready to lead his people again in true worship with all the priesthood behind him. Surely, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And in doing all of that, they miss everything else God has been telling them. They miss the new temple that's going to be built on the last day. They miss the new heart of flesh. And they miss God's spirit dwelling in them. And in their quest to regain their lost glory, they miss the original mission of God. To bless the nations with reconciliation and repentance. The way we see our past affects our ability to see God's future. And we end up making decisions that are opposite of God's way for us. And you know, we are no different. It's easy to be distracted by a memory of the past and to ask ourselves, what happened? For most of us, all we have to do is look at our phones. Apps like Facebook or Google Photos can easily stoke the fires of manufactured nostalgia with perfectly timed throwback photos and posts. When we look back at those memories removed from its context, they're going to seem like simpler times, unclouded from the drama and confusion that we might be intimately familiar with right now. Relationships with various family members might feel less complicated then, whether it's good or bad. Some of us might remember our youthful energy and vigor, and maybe our professional future was still full of unlimited possibilities. Maybe back then our faith in God felt unshakable, And maybe Jesus didn't seem to demand so much of us yet. The temptation of nostalgia is to find a way to get all those feelings back. To make a home out of an impression of a memory. It could express itself more extremely as a type of midlife crisis. Throwing out our faith, our family, and our current future away all to start over again. But it also comes in smaller ways too. The way we keep trying to prove our youthfulness to others by showing people that you still got it, driving when you shouldn't, or not letting others serve you. Or maybe it's the way we keep reliving our grudges in our head, eager for the other person's comeuppance. The way we can't criticize our own childhood experiences because then we would have to question whether our own parents raised us right or worse whether we raised our own children right, and then trying to make up for it by trying to fix them after they've long left and cleft. Or even the way we prefer the version of Christianity that we grew up with over the one that's found right here in the Bible. 
This home built on nostalgia is pure foolishness. Ecclesiastes doesn't mince words for our obsession with the past. It says in chapter 7, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. So why do we ask it in the first place? Well, because it's comfortable. It's familiar. It gives meaning to what feels meaningless. It's our own way of manufacturing redemption on our own. And it can feel like the closest thing to home. It's why comfort food exists. It's not usually healthy, but the memories linger on. It's why if you grew up with cigarette smoke in your house, you might still linger nearby if you smell it years later. And it's why our recurring sins and difficult relationships are so hard to address permanently. When I was in graduate school, I knew a student who was treated extremely harshly by his professor. His body and mind deteriorated working under him, and he hated him, full stop. But he also told me that one day, when he would become a professor, he would behave even more harshly to his future students. Why? I asked him. Why would you do that, knowing everything you've gone through? He told me, because his professor was successful. That is what is demanded for success. You see, even in grad school, in just a few years, this student reinterpreted all of his sufferings as a pathway, a roadmap for success. He reinterpreted his, the suffering from his life in order to justify his future. Do you see? It's that easy. We just won't let us stop. And the worst part is this. Our pursuit of nostalgia makes us ignore all the good works of God happening in your life. Every little thing that God is doing right now with you and those around you to fulfill his mission of blessing the nations through the gospel. Our nostalgia forsakes the forgiveness of God in favor of a feeling that keeps us spinning in circles in the parking lot until our tires are bald and burning up in smoke. Nostalgia makes it impossible to see. We become so focused on the triumphal entry itself that we miss the conclusion of that first day in verse 11. Jesus has left the temple and Jerusalem. There's nothing there. You don't look for fruit from a tree out of season, and you don't look for rest from what isn't home. And we know he's right. We know Jesus is right because the day after Jesus clears the temple, the fig tree withers up. So too is the fate of that temple. It cannot save anyone and has no other use than waiting for its own destruction. So, what about you? Are you looking for fruit from a barren tree? Where do your memories and experiences prevent you from seeing the new thing that God is doing in you, around you, or through you? What old feelings are you still chasing right now? And what is it that you're still trying to call home? Home is where God dwells, and we'll never find it dwelling in nostalgia. We have to keep moving forward. So we need to ask our second question. Where is it? How do I get home? Sometimes when there's a major change in administration, there is a move. King Charles of England, after a long week of working at Buckingham Palace, he's going to travel not to Windsor Palace, where his mother considered home, but rather to Highgrove House, about 90 miles away. That's his home. And in verses 20 through 26, Jesus is also announcing a change in administration. He's changing headquarters. It's time to move to a new home. Now, this passage has been famously misused, so we need to stop a little bit and be clear about what this passage is not saying. It's not a passage about you doing anything if you just have enough faith. So many people in the church have been hurt because of this teaching. And I will say it is absolutely, unequivocally wicked to tell someone that they didn't get healed or that their loved ones died or that someone wasn't saved because you didn't have enough faith or that you didn't believe hard enough. If you've ever been told this in your life, I'm sorry. Because this passage isn't about you moving mountains with faith. It's about Jesus. He's the one who doesn't doubt. He's the one who believes what he says will pass, and it will be done for him. That's what happened with the fig tree. Jesus said it, 
the fig tree withers. And now, Jesus is saying something about not just any mountain, but this specific mountain in verse 23. Jesus says, this mountain. And when we're talking about mountains in the Bible, we're talking about where heaven and earth meet. We're talking about where God reveals himself to his people. That's what Jerusalem, and in particular, the temple on Mount Zion is supposed to be. So when Jesus is talking about throwing this mountain into the sea, he's saying, biblically speaking, this mountain's not a mountain anymore. The temple's significance as a spiritual conduit is over. So, if not that mountain, then which one? We need to find a new mountain, a new place where God dwells with his people. We need to see where Jesus is relocating his administration. And if we follow him out of Jerusalem, we're going to find that every night he walks 40 minutes away from Jerusalem to go back to a small village in Bethany. Why? What's there? At the very beginning of the chapter, Mark points out that Jesus starts his triumphal entry from a less famous, more nondescript mountain in this village the Mount of Olives. It's not a coincidence that Jesus is traveling from one mountain to another. After all, location matters. You might remember from the other Gospels that the triumphal entry is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9 with a picture of the righteous king of peace entering the city of peace on a colt. But Mark doesn't reference that. He wants to make sure you know about the Mount of Olives because he's going to paint a different picture based on Zechariah 14. In that picture, Jerusalem is not at peace. The people are not rejoicing. We are treated to a gruesome image of the people of God under siege, the city in flames, and the people desecrated. And at the very darkest moment, we see the Lord himself going out to fight against the enemies of God. Zechariah 14.4, it says, On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. Jesus begins his triumphal entry standing on the Mount of Olives because he is fulfilling another prophecy that it is through what happens there that the Lord is going to save his people from devastation. So what is it that happens there at the Mount of Olives? Well, Jesus comes back. It's where, after the Passover, he comes back to pray. And it's in that garden, Gethsemane, where Judas appears at midnight to have Jesus arrested by the Jewish authorities. So, starting once again at the Mount of Olives, Jesus begins an entirely different kind of triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This time, there are no disciples around, for they've all fled. There are no tree leaves, there is no rejoicing, and there is no cry of help for salvation. Instead of a cult, he's led by villains. This time, when he enters the temple grounds, Jesus is the one who's overturned with false testimonies and a corrupt priesthood. He's the one who is cursed. He's the one on the cross, withering away. And when Jesus finally dies on the cross, Mark includes one final detail in chapter 15, verse 38. Mark says this, The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So, I didn't finish reading the prophecy in Zechariah 14. The entire verse, verse 4, says this, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. The second half of this prophecy talks about the ripping apart of a mountain in two like a sheet of paper is sheared in half. And it is in between those sheared halves where Zechariah says this, Then the Lord my God will come. Home is where God dwells. And to Zechariah, when God splits that mountain in half, he's here. He's home. On the cross, Jesus' death has split in two that curtain of the temple, that temple on the mountain. And three days later, when Jesus conquered death by rising from the dead, 
a new home was finished and furnished for a new mountain. Jesus himself, it's a home built with living stones, the people of God themselves. That's us. We're those living stones. And you know what mountain the scriptures call us? Mount Zion. We're the home on the mountain that God dwells in. And Christ is the unbreakable cornerstone. Home is where God dwells. And if we would be willing to take off those nostalgia-covered lenses, we would see that we're already here. So when you look around yourselves here at Walnut Creek, what do you see? You see home. Not the building, but all of us. It's not perfect. Sin and pain still reside within our natures. But the Spirit of God is dwelling in us, in our home, in our hearts. And you know what we can finally do when we're home? We can remember the stories of the past as they really are. No nostalgia needed. No need to recreate our past. No need to create a new future for ourselves. We can simply rest in a nurturing home and anticipate the future God has already been preparing for us. So knowing this, we can ask one last question for ourselves. How can I stop trying to take my history into my own hands? How can I learn to become comfortable with the home that God has built for me? How can I stop striving for my own future? I'd like to offer two suggestions. They're small suggestions. The first suggestion is to continue being together every week, just as we're doing today. This gathering place is where we can learn to enjoy what God is doing now as he continually, faithfully meets us. This is where God feeds us with his supper. This is is where God strengthens us through his word. This is where we learn to forgive one another. Home is where God gives us Sabbath, true rest. We're all learning to get used to the home that Jesus is preparing for us right now. The second suggestion I have for us all is to consider singing or praying through the Psalms. There's something very special about God's songbook in that it captures the fullest range of emotions, feelings, and experiences of every believer. From deepest sorrow to overflowing joy. From utter abandonment to quiet comfort. If we remember that all the Psalms are about Jesus, then we can know that Jesus is right alongside us in all that we go through. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus doesn't just enter into our experiences. He teaches us how to respond. He gives us the right interpretation of our past so that we can rightly see the coming kingdom of God clearly. So we can sing for God's justice on our enemies rather than seek revenge. We can pray for the new kingdom to come rather than consolidate power. We can seek comfort from our great shepherd rather than drown in entertainment. And in both of these suggestions, what do we see? Prayer. Jesus said that his house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And in his death and resurrection, he brought all of us near to God, free from the sin that has kept us away from the house of the Lord. If you are in Christ, you are home. And just like it says in Mark 11, in this new home, in this new temple, we will truly be that house of prayer, reconciled to each other and reconciled to God. So, imagine What will being with Jesus be like in the new creation? What will our restored relationships look like? What will it be like to live in a city that's no longer called forsaken, but called Hepzibah, God's delight? And what will it be like to see God unveiled face to face? No more looking back with nostalgia-tinted lenses. Look ahead and imagine. Let's go home. Let's pray. Father, help us come home, not to the image of what we want, but to the home that Christ has been preparing for us all this time. We need your spirit to open our eyes to this beautiful work that he has done for us, to help us from looking backwards with nostalgia and instead seeing that everything we have experienced is pointing us ahead to Jesus' open arms. Teach us to sing of your salvation and to see how all things have worked together for our good and for your glory, no matter how difficult it is to believe it. Bring us home, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Amen.